All right, just a roll call to confirm folks are here. Commissioner Cameron? Yes, good morning, everyone. I am here. Commissioner O'Brien? Hi, I am here. Commissioner Zuniga? Good morning, I'm here. Okay, that's the four of us. And as you know, everyone, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Austin, and thank you, Tanya, for your help. It's being recorded um, and held virtually because of relief granted by the governor through um, an executive order back in March of 2020 to allow public bodies like ours to be able to meet virtually in light of the pandemic. So here we are, um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> well over a year now. Um, and approaching a year and two months. So uh, we appreciate that uh, capacity. We've enjoyed it on a weekly basis. Uh, we'll get started. Today is April 26, just after 10 o'clock. It's public meeting 342. We don't have minutes today, um, so we're going to get started right away with our administrative update. Executive Director Wells, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. I'm going to turn it over to Loretta Lilios and Bruce Van to get, just give you an update on what's been going on at the casinos as we've been doing at our regular public meetings for, for quite a while now to uh, let you know uh, the uh, adherence to the COVID protocols and what's going on with that. So I'll start with Loretta and then we'll go over to Bruce. Great, thank you. Thank, thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. You know, Kathy, you mentioned the one year and two two month uh, timeline, and uh, you know we've been at it, and all three of the licensees have have been at it as well. And uh, you know, from the executive level uh, through all levels of their uh, staffing, there is continued uh, adherence to the measures uh, that into place uh, for you know, the health and safety and uh, they really haven't uh, let up. Uh, so I don't have any significant incidents of concern to mention to you today. Uh, you know, I can say that I do have a report that at uh, MGM, they're starting to think about the warmer weather and that they have plans to open uh, their outdoor patio at TAP uh, on May 7th uh, for dining. Uh, consistent with all uh, protocols. I do also have a report that because of the measures they put into place to monitor uh, hotel activity, uh, I understand that late last week they uh, were able to uh, intervene in what would have been a, 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 a party, <laughs> a, a, an unallowed gap, indoor gathering. So, you know, that did not happen. Uh, their measures allowed them to, to intervene uh, on that. You know, PPC, their racing season uh, began, as you know, um, uh, as well as uh, at Encore. Uh, I, I do understand that it's been designated as a, a vaccination site starting tomorrow, uh, where uh, uh, vaccines will be available to the public and to their uh, uh, to their employees as well. Uh, I know Bruce is here and has some details on uh, operations over the past two week period since we publicly reported last. I uh, go to him and then we'll you know answer any any questions that you might have. Before we move to Bruce, do we have any? Um, do you have questions, commissioners, for Loretta? Um, one of the developments that we just learned of was the designation of Encore as a vaccination site, indicating again, it's a good partnership with not only its immediate um, host community, Everett, but really for the entire Commonwealth. Loretta, do you know um, where the uh, vaccines will be distributed in the ballrooms or do you, do you know? That was, that was my understanding. I, honestly, Kathy, I don't have a lot of details uh, on it. I know that it's, uh, the kickoff is tomorrow uh, okay. and that they were going to be able to uh, utilize some of the space that's been uh, underutilized because of, you know, this whole situation. Right. Well, I know the ballrooms. One of the ballrooms. I know they yeah. extended that invitation early on, so it must be that the state has figured out that they could utilize that now. So that's very good. Okay, any other questions for Loretta? All right. Okay, Bruce, what do you have? I'm sorry to interrupt the other one. 
it, uh, mine is mostly the occupancy. Uh, it's been steady at MGM, uh, both on, uh, on both Saturdays, the 17th and on the 24th. Uh, they were at 21% occupancy. Uh, they had a car giveaway on both Saturdays. Uh, th that was real steady. Uh, they started, uh, uh, they finally got their craps tables operating. They have two uh, craps tables. Uh, that seems to be going very well for them. Uh, PPC, a little different on Fridays. Uh, both Fridays, they had 31% occupancy on both the 16th and on the 23rd. They had uh, My Choice was their uh, player uh, promotion, and that was both on Fridays, on, unlike the other two properties, which was Saturdays is their high occupancy. Uh, at Encore Boston Harbor, Theirs was Saturday the 17th and uh, Saturday the 24th as well. And their high occupancy was 19% on both as well. And they had a free slot uh, promotion as well, free slot play. Uh, other than that, there is really nothing uh, real important to, to report. There haven't been any instances. Uh, everything's been running smoothly. Questions? Quick, quick. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, quick question, uh, Bruce. Do you have a comparison of pre-pandemic uh, number for Friday or Saturday night? How, where, you know, how much is, uh, I know the numbers are gradually building, but how do they compare to those numbers? Do you have that information? I, I you know, I, I think they're a little lower than pre-pandemic, but we don't have as many uh, people playing at the tables because we're right now at four seats at a blackjack table. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have poker and uh, a few of those, so the numbers are, are somewhat lower, but I wouldn't say they're greatly lower. I, I don't have counts for, for pre-numbers at that point. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Calls from Mr. Okay. Any, okay, Commissioner Zimka? Yeah, thank you. I, um... I, I have a question now for Loretta. I, re I realize that maybe she doesn't have these details, Loretta, but in case you know, or in case you could report back at a later time, relative to the vaccination uh, site uh, at Ancor, um, do you happen to know if they will be having sort of walk-ins or they're all sort of um, uh, scheduled appointments, or it might be a combination of both? Um, because there's perhaps a, a good captive population there who might want to walk in uh, at the casino. Maybe that's a reason they were designated uh, as a site. My, my understanding, uh, Enrique, from conversations last week was that it was uh, starting out appointments, but I would want to uh, confirm uh, that and, and I can uh, do that and report back. Thank you. I think it's going to help employees too. Um, and, but it is open for the public and and particularly the those surrounding communities will be so accessible so hopefully they'll take advantage of that easy access okay that's great news good news all right um commissioner o'brien are you all set oh there you are okay you're all set thank you um, Karen, do you have anything else for today? No, that's it for item number two, ma'am. All right, great. Thank you so much. And we're going to move on to um, Loretta and Bruce. Thank you. It's an important update and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, moving on then to the racing division. Good morning, Dr. Lightbound. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Good. So our item today is the um, split of the racehorse development fund that was established in 23K section 60. And um, it takes monies that are generated from the three casinos and um, puts them in the racehorse development fund. The horse racing committee uh, determines what they think the split of the money should be between the standard breads and the thoroughbreds. And the committee had um, a public hearing for comments, and then they had a, at least uh, two different meetings to discuss this. Um, all, uh, oh, as you know, um, Commissioner Cameron is on that committee as the representative um, for the commission. So she's here today to speak about it. And um, before she speaks about how the uh, committee worked on it, I will um, turn it over to general counsel, Todd Grossman, 
to talk about the um, mechanics of how the um, program is going. Good morning, Todd. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Lightbound. Good morning, everybody. Um, to, this is more of a refresher slash reminder as we've, of course, done this uh, at least on two other occasions as a, a group. But this comes from section 60 of chapter 23K. And you'll recall that the statute specifically says the commission may only change the distribution percentage upon a recommendation by the horse racing committee. And the horse racing committee has done that. They have made that recommendation that was done on March 22nd at an open public meeting of the committee as Dr. Lightbound just mentioned. Um, as required by statute, the committee's recommendation was then sent um, to the clerks of the Senate and House of Representatives uh, 33 days ago. Um, as so we're in compliance with the statute and this is ripe uh, for review for approval by the commission. You'll recall, of course, that there are essentially what we call three buckets um, that have uh, distribution percentages or splits um, uh, assigned to them. They fall in the uh, categories of purses. That's the 80% of the funds. They go to breeding um, efforts. That's 16% of the funds. Then they essentially go to health and pension or health and welfare benefits, which is 4% um, of the total amount of the funds. And within each of those three categories, the committee has recommended a split between the two respective uh, industry breeds, the thoroughbreds and the standard breeds. The uh, recommendations are set out in a letter, which I believe is in the packet, and that's the letter that was sent to the uh, legislative leadership. And um, I'll, I'll go through it quickly, and then I'd be happy also just to point out what the difference is from last year. So the first one um, relative to purses, the recommendation is that 92% uh, be afforded to the standard breads and 8% to the thoroughbred uh, interests. Um, that has uh, changed from last year where it was a 70-30 split, split. The second in the breeding category, the recommendation is that it be changed to a 75-25 25 split standard bread and thoroughbred and that has changed from last year where it was again a 70 uh, 30 split standard bread thoroughbred and third uh, on the health and pension benefit uh, bucket the recommendation is that the uh, funds be split 50 50. That is a change from last year where the split in that category was 40% to the standard bread and 60% to the thoroughbred. The rationale for these changes was discussed by the horse racing committee at its public meeting. Um, and there are two uh, letters or other sub submissions, if you will, that are in the public packet, the commission's public packet that were reviewed by the horse racing committee. Um, in making those recommendations. So you can see uh, some of the rationale that uh, is behind uh, these changes. Um, and uh, that's, I think that's, that's an overview of where we stand uh, with all of this. The recommendations are now before you for final approval, or you could, and of course, uh, send the, any of those recommendations back to the committee for reconsideration um, if you were to so choose. The other uh, thing that I would just uh, remind uh, the commission about, we talked about this a little bit about at the agenda setting meeting, is a provision of uh, section 60 in the 4% category. You remember there's a piece of language in there that talks about that the commission uh, determines after the split is already set, uh, how much of that 4% uh, category shall be paid annually uh, by the associations, both the thoroughbred and the standard bred association, um, to jockeys organizations for purposes of health insurance, life insurance, and other benefits uh, for active and disabled thoroughbred jockeys. That piece of the uh, decision making is not uh, on the agenda today but it's worth remem remembering that it's there and 
we've discussed putting it on a, a future agenda uh, for the commission's consideration. Todd, may I interrupt there? Is it strictly jockey or is it jockey and driver? Uh, I think it's, it's jockey and driver. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, it's, it's both. Contrast to the recent decision that the commission just made relative to that $65,000 payment to the jockeys guild, that just goes to the thoroughbred jockey. Okay. Um, Could I add a few um, comments about the work of the um, of the committee, Madam Chair? Yes, if you could, um, I'd like to focus on that, but I do want to um, return to the section section four issue as well. But we want to hear from you, Gail, on the um, the split. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think um, I think uh, Dr. Lightbaum and um, and uh, Chief Counsel Grossman just laid out the work, the timing, the law. Uh, I would like to add as a member of the committee, um, we, the work was done a little bit differently this year, meaning um, typically the um, standard bread and the thoroughbred uh, representatives are not in agreement on what the split should be. And it has come to the uh, committee members to find what we have always thought was, was an appropriate number based on um, the many, many factors uh, that we statutorily have to consider, as, as well as uh, all the uh, statistics from all of the previous year on how many races, all of that uh, relevant information. Um, this year, um, the two representatives did do some work in advance, and they did come to what they thought was an appropriate split um, but of course, we, as the remaining committee members, wanted to make sure we did our due diligence and we actually um, asked those two to come back to us with more information, really looking at all of the factors that they considered and um, all of the relevant uh, numbers from the previous year's racing. They did that. We did have a chance. We did have a public hearing, too, um, in which Frankly, we didn't have a lot of input. Um, I know there's some letters that came in after the fact, uh, but I believe the committee did its due diligence and um, we did decide that those numbers were appropriate for this year. And, um, um, and I just wanted to talk about the work of the committee and how we came about these numbers, which are pretty different than they've been in the past. But as we know, there is no racing now uh, for thoroughbreds, so I, I do think the, the differences are, um, um, are, are appropriate. So questions. That, oh, I just have one. So the, the numbers that we're seeing, the, those weren't changed by the committee at large, I assume, that those were in fact the numbers that were proposed? They are. They are the numbers and as I said, we did ask for uh, the appropriate documentation to really uh, be able to consider why uh, those changes were being recommended. Okay, thank you. So, uh, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Sunaga. Yes, absolutely. Oh, th thank you. Um, just, just in general, in the, the history of um, of the factors that the committee has looked at, is, is it fair to say that they, they've looked at factors that are typically retrospective in nature, the number of races and starts and breeding and um, uh, activity, et cetera, on prior year or years, which then, um, you know, begs the question uh, uh, as to one, one, one issue that is brought up in one of the letters as to whether the commission, the, the committee is, has considered or should consider prospective, um, a prospective factor. Um, the notion of uh, business certainty by at least one of the investors um, that uh, if, if there's only retrospective factors, this, this might put the trajectory of one in, in which there's less and less um, going to the to the thoroughbreds uh, by, by, by virtue of the reality of, 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 um, of the landscape. 
So a long-winded way of saying, um, what, how would you characterize the consideration of the committee of a prospective factor? Or is, has it always been factors that look back at the, at the activity? Uh, Commissioner, um, I think the committee over the years has done both. We have um, looked at, we have made decisions year by year. So for this year's decision, we looked at all of last year's statistics and numbers. And, um, but we have also, and, and typically it's the thoroughbred representative who will bring us information about, okay, um, this is what's happening. There's, there are two, say, uh, promising investors to build a new track. And we have taken that information into consideration in our decisions in the past. Now this year, um, what uh, the representatives and the um, NEH um, um, BPA is the authorized group per the legislation to be, um, to be the representative on the committee and to be representing all the thoroughbred horsemen and women. And um, they did, in fact, check with, there were two, to their knowledge, two prospective uh, investors who were looking. They did, in fact, check with those groups um, and say, look, this is why we're, you know, we are um, recommending these splits. And those groups did not have, um, did not bring us any concerns about, about these numbers. Yeah. I thought that was an important factor to consider. Mm -hmm. And we did, like I say, do our due diligence as the other committee members to make sure that work had been done in advance. Now, as we know with the thoroughbred horsemen and women, there are differences of opinions, um, significant differences of opinions of how that money should be used. And um, we take all those factors into consideration. And, and frankly, it's, it's never been a situation where you can please everyone but we try to make those decisions based on all of the relevant information. Thank you. Commissioner Zuniga, if I may, and commissioners, uh, just as a point of fact, you'll recall there is a good amount of money sitting in the fund from years past that hasn't been expended for purposes of first payments. Uh, so that exists um, at present. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And that has also been, at least um, with this commission, a, a bit of a different take as to what those monies, who those monies belong to. Um, there's, there's some uh, in, in the thoroughbred group that would call it, you know, thoroughbred uh, money. And um, I have been, at least in the past, of the position that that's Commonwealth money. Um, that, uh, uh, but, but, but nonetheless, I, I, I thank you for mentioning um, that uh, because that's also part of a factor here that, um, that some of the letters reference. Any further questions on the, the, um, the horse racing committee's work, of which, again, a reminder, it was, it was a letter uh, to the legislature that um, sent indicating those purses and we haven't heard back um, from them um, as to any concerns that uh, it's been 33 days. Uh, <clears throat> just wanna circle back to the point that uh, Councillor um, Grossman raised, which is the um, other statutory provision that points back to the 4% um, amount in which under the statute we as a commission must make an affirmative determination with respect to the jockeys and drivers. Um, that wasn't on the agenda as Councillor uh, Grossman points out. Um, it will be on the agenda. Uh, Executive Director Wells, I think we were thinking that we could be prepared from May 6 on that. Yeah, that was just the discussion internally. Um, I also think that we discussed possibility that we might seek public comment on that topic. Um, and I don't know if you're prepared, Todd or Karen, to elaborate on that today. 
So, uh, Madam Chair, I think that the thinking internally was um, given that there is the statutory provision for that for that uh, split. It is not the race uh, the committee that makes that recommendation. That's uh, the burden is on the commission itself. So it may be an opportunity now to request public comment on that. So on the 6th, when the commission makes a decision, uh, we can have some uh, information uh, that the commission can get from the stakeholders when they in fact make that decision. Uh, I think our internal suggestion was we put it out for written comments so those comments can be submitted before that uh, May 6th meeting. Uh, we can look at the you know the dates on the calendar on sort of a due date for those and what the commission thinks would be reasonable but that way um, the commission isn't making that decision in a vacuum the stakeholders have some input into uh, how that should be divided and maybe it would be helpful dr lipon if you just outline again the um the issue as i understand it um it would address uh whether we um determine that a, uh, some percentage of that 4% goes to jockeys and drivers, jockeys or drivers are, are neither, um, but uh, that we do have an obligation to make this determination. Yes, that is correct. And um, it does involve both the drivers and the jockeys. And so, um, you know, we'd be interested to hear from um, each organization. The way the um, uh, statute's written, it falls to the horsemen's organizations um, to bring it up. Um, the drivers are members of the Standard Bread Horsemen's Association. Um, the On the thoroughbred side, the jockeys are not um, included unless they are, say, a um, trainer and qualified that way. So uh, we would be looking for something from each organization, um, maybe uh, detailing um, what uh, groups are included now in their benefit programs, and um, perhaps um, what other monies may be available for the different groups, because they do get um, monies out of the handle. Um, the jockeys groups, obviously, they um, are getting the 65,000 that comes out of the racing handle. So that would be interesting, I believe, for the commission also to have um, that, that kind of information available to them. And so uh, today we would ask for public comments in writing and there would be something posted on the website that would explain this in a little further detail after today's meeting, Karen? Yeah, that, that was the plan that we coordinated with Todd and Alex to come up with exactly what the request is and then uh, set it to communications department to Austin and Sarah to post on the website so people can see in writing what the exact request is and where to submit the comment. And one other point, and then I'll turn to the commissioners. Um, this piece doesn't mean that we can't vote on the split that Commissioner Cameron is bringing forward with Dr. Light Brown and today um, but it would be notice to the organizations that this piece of business is still out out there but we're going to tend to it you know do course on hopefully by may 6th is that right that's correct okay any questions commissioners uh, no questions madam chair but i think it's totally appropriate to just to bring this matter forward since we have uh, received inquiries about it and the public comments are certainly will be helpful to our work. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, the the only one logistical question I have, if we if we shoot for May six, uh, we could uh, have a due date for the public comments of say maybe Monday, May third. Or did the commissioners want some time on the public comments? Because we could accept comments all the way up to the fifth but you may want a couple of days to look at the comments right. before the meeting, right? Yeah, I think there's a little compilation, you know, if, if we get them, Alex will want to compile them for us. So so that would give, if, if it's, today's the 26th, so that would give a week and a half, is that right? Well, it would give a week if it's it's a week till May third. Um, we want to yeah, say right. that uh, one week. comments we do May third. That gives people a week to submit written comments. 
Commissioner Bryan, do you think that works or should we go, um, we'll give them a few more days, or do you think? Um, maybe uh, they probably have, um, Dr. Lightbound, maybe you have a better sense of how much public comment you think we're gonna get and do we get them on a rolling basis? Um, yeah. I something you flag where you say, look, this needs more exploring, we can always pull it off the agenda if it needs to be followed up on, but I don't really have an issue with it coming in through the day before as long as we don't think we're gonna be inundated. Right, I don't think, um, I think it'll be primarily um, from specific groups of people. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the number of submissions will be that um, many. Um, if there are a lot, it'll probably be um, fairly repetitive, um, yeah. just you know, stating the same thing from different people in a different organization. Mm -hmm. in the organization. Um, it may take a little while for the um, groups to get some of the information together. So I think if they could have a week and a half instead of a week, that would be beneficial to them. Um, so, so if you could, if the commission's comfortable with getting the information closer to the deadline. Well, and then maybe does it make more sense to just give them two weeks and put it out to the next meeting? That, that might make more sense. To just give them enough time right. to comment and and since we are going ahead with the split decision i think that's the urgency with both uh breeds and this is a follow-up and if it takes an extra two weeks i think we rather right. have a full you could even you could even give them you know three weeks and we get it a week prior and then you're putting it out you know four weeks so we did get a comment from somebody who's joined us um, through the Snapchat, a member of the, um, the horse racing community, who said that they do they would need more time. So um, as long as again that the, uh, everyone's on notice that that four percent could be fluid, right? Because we still have to make that determination. We could go to the um, the next meeting. Then would be the uh, the twentieth, and then. Um, so why don't we do, uh, let's get this done on the 20th. I think that makes sense. And um, we can have the, um, the public comments due by May 18th, and then our team can compile them for the, the public package, which they do on the day before. So that gives Jamie and Marianne and team so a little bit of time to get them organized. Let's just see, I've got another, so thank you. So thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, does that so that seems like it works, Commissioner Zuniga? You were going to chime in does that on the same on the same matters. So I'm perfectly fine. I I, I was going to point out that uh, typically we've done two weeks as a minimum, but only yeah. because we would go from meeting to meeting, and you know we have a little off schedule this time. But it sounds like it's been addressed. So. Right, in my head, I was you know, thinking it was the full two weeks, but it really isn't. Um, so this will give plenty of time. Everybody's on notice. We're gonna to attend to this matter um, on the 20th and, and then we'll be done this piece of work. I think that makes sense, right? Yes. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, um, so with that taken care of, uh, General Counsel Grossman, we do have a vote today that we need to take on the split. Do I have a motion? I think I saw Todd shaking his head. So, um, uh, be, be, be really, we need a, a motion, yes. Before any motions, I, I just a point oh, of sorry. clarification, if I may. Um, I know in the past we've done retroactive um, because of recommendations. There's nothing like that this time when Whenever right something now. becomes effective by our we, vote, that's when we go yeah. to. Right, because the racing season just started. The committee was very cognizant of that fact that that can be problematic, and we really worked hard to get our work done in a timely manner so that uh, it would coincide with the beginning of racing season. Great. I like that, Commissioner Cameron. I think it's a good practice for going forward, right? It is. Uh, we had quorum issues in the past, Madam Chair, which caused our work to be delayed. Um, but we have we have a full committee, and we understood the urgency of, of working in a way that uh, did not cause any disruption or or any speaking any talk about a, um, a retroactive. Perfect. Um, 
I'd be happy to make the motion, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you so much. I, um, I move that the commission approve the distribution percentages recommended by the Horse Racing Committee in accordance with Chapter 23K, Section 60B relative to the Horse Race Development Fund as discussed here today as follows. For the 80% distribution for purses for live races, 92% shall go to the standard breads and 8% to the thoroughbreds. For the 16% distributions for the breeding program, 75% shall go to the standard bread and 25% to the thoroughbred. And for the 4% distribution for health and pension benefits, 50% shall go to the standard bread and 50% to the thoroughbred. Second. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, I just want to thank the, the members of the Horse Racing Committee and particularly uh, Chair Fitzgerald. Um, the last couple of years it really has been going smoothly even though it's complicated and for that we appreciate everyone's hard work so thank you roll call vote commissioner cameron aye commissioner o'brien aye commissioner zunica aye and i vote yes four zero vivian no not vivian tanya thank you so much see you now thank you then i think we're all set to move on to our next item. Are we all set, Dr. Lightbound? Thank you very much. Until the next meeting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we wish the um, horse racing community um, continued uh, good luck um, as the racing schedule proceeds. Okay, then we're on to um, item number four. Uh, there's a... Um, Director Lilios, and I know that Kate will be joining. Thank you so much. Sure, and if I can jump in before, just to circle back to Commissioner Zuniga's question about the uh, Encore vaccination site. So I have had a uh, follow-up that at, at this point, appointments are needed, appointments are available, uh, or will be available through the state website, and that Encore will be coordinating the appointment schedule for its own employees. Uh, and facilitating, uh, facilitating that. Um, so with that, I would uh, turn the next agenda item over to uh, Attorney Hardigan, who is going to present the IEP's findings on an MGM qualifier. Good morning. Good morning, Counselor. How are you? Oh, very well, thank you, and it's nice to see everybody. I do have a qualifier for your consideration this morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, and it is uh, Mr. Todd Miner. He's a qualifier for MGM Springfield. Um, the investigative team in this case who are joining us on this call are Trooper Kevin Owen of the Massachusetts State Police, and as I see in his square there, uh, Matt Jordan, the financial investigator. Um, and uh, I would note that pursuant to request, Mr. Miner submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. Uh, the IEB was able to conduct its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers and did confirm financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases. On March 2nd of 2021, um, Mr. Minor was interviewed using virtual technology by the investigative team I mentioned, Trooper Owen and Investigator Jordan. He was noted to be cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. Uh, during the interview, Mr. Minor provided his personal history and career path to the investigators. It was noted that after graduating from college at the University of California in Santa Barbara, he worked for multiple different accounting firms at various entry-level positions. Uh, he then relocated in 1999 from California to Las Vegas and accepted a position with Arthur Anderson as a senior auditor there. It was while employed with Arthur Anderson that he was introduced to the financial side of the gaming industry um, as he had uh, multiple gaming-related clients there. After Arthur Anderson was acquired by Deloitte, uh, Mr. Miner did remain with Deloitte as a senior auditor for approximately one year. In 2003, uh, Mr. Miner then accepted a position with MGM Resorts International, and he has remained with MGM Resorts since 2003. Um, he has had several positions within the company, uh, starting uh, first as a manager of financial reporting. He then was promoted to director of financial reporting. 
He then became assistant vice president of financial reporting, a vice president of financial reporting, and held that position from 2009 to 2016. And in 2016, he was promoted to senior vice president of financial reporting. And I would note that during the um, dependency of this investigation, he was further promoted to be also chief accounting officer. Um, it's uh, the subject of this investigation was his position as senior vice president of financial reporting and in that role, Mr. Minor is responsible for the company's financial reporting and accounting. He handles everything from the company's SEC filings to day to day accounting responsibilities. He has six direct reports, including two vice presidents of financial reporting, one senior vice president of corporate accounting and three vice presidents who oversee um, the finance shared service center. MGM has a financial shared service center that does substantial gaming, audit, and accounting work um, connected with MGM Springfield. This would include revenue and tax filings for, um, for, that are provided to the MGC. Um, and this is why Mr. Minor was found to be a qualifier in Massachusetts. Mr. Minor reports directly to Jonathan Halkyard, who is the chief financial officer of MGM Resorts International. Uh, Mr. Minor graduated from Jesuit High School in Carmichael, California in 1992, and following high school, he enrolled at the University of California in Santa Barbara. In 1996, he graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics and a concentration in accounting, which as you can see through his career path, he's put uh, to significant use, especially in his roles with MGM. Uh, at present, Mr. Minor is only seeking qualification in Massachusetts, and as I stated, that is due to the reporting structure with the Financial Shared Services Center and its uh, substantial work that it does for MGM Springfield. Uh, and Mr. Minor has demonstrated uh, to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable, and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for MGM Springfield. If there are questions, I'm happy to hear from the commissioners, and as I stated, the investigators uh, are able to help as well. Thank you. I just want to say good morning to Matt. It's nice to see you there. Thank you. Good morning to you, Chair. Nice to see you too. Yeah, thank you for your good work. Uh, questions for uh, Kate and Matt. Commissioner O'Brien? Oh, you're still on mute. Yeah, I know my iPad is not cooperating this morning. Um, Kate, you touched on this a little bit, but if you could just clarify the timing a little bit more about, um, you know, he's held the position since 2016. They opened the casino in 18. Sure. The, job responsibility shifted at a certain point after that which is why we're getting this now as opposed to closer to the opening correct and it, it is connected directly to that reporting structure and how his position and promotions have um kind of um intersected with the financial services center responsibility in terms of um the mgm um financial records and filings that are required for the MGC. So um, that is why he um, falls into our box for qualification and at this time, um, despite the fact he's held that position uh, since 2016 and has made his way up through, through the ranks. Right, okay, thank you. Sure. Kate, with respect to that, um, when I spoke with you about the same question, um, you indicated that now there may be a possibility with his newest promotion to chief that other jurisdictions may find him to be a qualifier. Uh, will you have to do an update now because of this change in his uh, I think, position? I think that would largely depend on, um, you know, any significant change in his reporting responsibilities. We certainly have um, a very good um, flow of information back and forth between our, our contacts at MGM. Mr. Madamba specifically was very helpful um, in this investigation. So um, if there was significant change to the job responsibilities, we certainly could um, update it. But at this point, um, where they're all kind of um, accounting and recording responsibilities that go up the chain, um, with respect to his involvement in Massachusetts, I don't see a significant change based on his promotion to CAO. Um, but I'm happy to follow up on that as well, if you'd like. Loretta, you think that that's a... So, you know, any additional responsibilities that he may have, we record those, they, you know, those are recorded to us. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily impact his suitability, but we do record 
uh, any updates in responsibilities, uh, uh, you know, as part of the ongoing of the ongoing process. Does that address your question, Kathy? Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking. I hadn't really thought about it when um, Kate and I spoke, but today we are qualifying him for his past position and not for his current position. Oh, actually, he, um, Madam Chair, pardon the interruption, he holds both simultaneously. He's both a senior VP for financial accounting and chief accounting officer. Oh. Yes. But so we're still qualifying him just for the senior vice president. Th Not yes, that's, that's how the that's how the investigation came in. And again, with regard to his responsibilities in Massachusetts, those are um, through his role as senior VP. And, but if he had additional responsibilities that would make him a qualifier, it wouldn't change anything because he's already been deemed a qualifier, which is Loretta's point. He's already exactly. been so okay, recommended for suitability. Exactly. So we do track changes in responsibilities. Potentially, he could have a shift that would make him no longer be a qualifier in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, he could move on to a different area where Massachusetts doesn't fall under his responsibility anymore. Uh, but to the extent that he continues to have oversight of what happens in Massachusetts, we continue to receive updates of any additional responsibilities that the company may uh, may give to him. Thank you. Any questions for Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, I just, I, I actually just had a comment. Um, first of all, well done investigation. Congrats to the investigative team. Um, I agree there are no significant issues here that would impact uh, uh, qualification. And um, just a, a comment that I continue to be impressed by our um, licensee's ability and uh, Someone can come in at a very low level position in the casino industry and end up as a senior vice president within a fairly short amount of time. So the opportunities are uh, something I have noticed in many of our, um, these, um, these reports that come before us for approval. It just, uh, it is really a, an opportunity for lots of folks around the country. Anything further? All set, Commissioner O'Brien. Okay, Commissioner Seneca. All set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well done. Um, very helpful. And um, do we I need a vote. We do yes. need a vote. Yes. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission issue a positive determination of suitability to Todd Robert Minert in his capacity as Senior Vice President of Financial Reporting. And Chief Accounting Officer Kate, or just the one? Uh, well, um, you know, we, I suppose, as I said, his job responsibilities apply um, through the SVP role to Massachusetts, and that was the substance of the investigation. Um, if Director Lilios has any specific thoughts on that, I welcome them. But um, I think as the position came in in the interim, um, you could qualify him just for this title. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So Senior Vice President of Financial Reporting uh, for MGM Resorts International. Thank you. Second. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Seneca. Aye. And I vote yes. Four zero. Great. Thank you very much. And Matt, good to see you. Thank you for your good work. And um, and I'm, I'm, my apologies, uh, Kate, for the um, yes. member of the uh, GEU that helped. Yes, Trooper Kevin Owen. Thank you. So, um, Trooper Owen, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. We'll move on then. Um, let's see, what time is it? It's just a, a 10 of 11. Would it make sense to have a quick break now before we go in? I see Commissioner Zumiga nodding no, his head. It's just a natural um, break to, for the next block of time. I think so. Um, and you know, if we need to take another quick break during that, that's fine too. But why don't we take a break? It's just uh, nine minutes of 11. We'll reconvene at 11 for our community mitigation grants. And I see Chief Delaney there, so we look forward to that. Thanks so much. The team is all here. So we are going to get started now with the next item of business, the Community Mitigation Fund. Uh, Chief Delaney, why don't you set the stage? 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so for your consideration today, we have seven specific impact grant applications, all of which fall within the public safety operational cost <coughs> arena. Um, as you'll see in your memo, there are a total of 11 specific impact applications. Um, the remaining four are still under review. We, we needed to uh, have a couple of meetings with uh, some of these folks to get some additional information, which uh, we've gotten. So we expect that we should be back before the commission at the May 6th meeting to finish out the um, specific impact grant category. Um, Kate Hart, again, was the primary reviewer on each of these applications and is here with me uh, to answer any uh, specific questions you might have on the applications. Um, she did the deep dive, so I'll give you the sort of the surface view and um, if you have any detailed questions, you'll be um, here to answer them. And as I understand it uh, today, we will just be reviewing the applications uh, individually and then um, Chair, you'd like to wait on the votes until we finished uh, the specific impact category, is that correct? Yeah, uh, upon review of the materials and um, in speaking with Executive Director Wells and I was able to uh, reach Commissioner O'Brien, we thought it would make good sense, Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner Zuniga, to hold on the vote um, so that we could have kind of a full, fulsome discussion at the May 6th on, you know, as a collective body, if you will, and do our individual votes on that day of all 11 applications and today hear from them. And then also, if you have any questions or want any additional information, it could be, uh, the, the, um, those details could be supplemented at the May 6th meeting as well. Does that make sense? Is everyone comfortable with that? And that's completely consistent. Um, with what we did last year, if you recall, you know, we did sort of the two marathon sessions, but we didn't do any votes at the first one. We waited until the uh, end of the second session and then voted the entire uh, slate of, of grants. Yeah, and we might want to do individual. We can decide um, in terms of next week if we just take at least the category of public safety together as one. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, it looked like you were leaning in. Yeah, I was going to say I'm, I'm fine. However, everybody's comfortable because I, I realize I have the benefit of have observed a lot of the public, uh, a lot of the review team uh, discussion, and I'm quite familiar with, um, with the details. So, however, you guys, the rest of the commissioners want to, to, to take this. Yeah, I think it will allow us to cross-reference. Um, I did take a peek at the other applications, so there might be some cross-references I'd want to make, but I'm not comfortable doing it today without getting the benefit of the review team's input first. You know, I don't want to jump it down on that, so thanks. We'll get started then. If that, okay. Commissioner Cameron, you're okay with that approach? Sounds like an excellent approach, no worries. Okay, so, all righty, thank you. Okay, Joe, thank you so much. Okay, so the first um, application in front of you is the Everett Fire Department. Um, they are requesting $157,000 for a few different items. One is for uh, EMT training for some of their uh, staff, uh, also for the replacement of portable radios and a new vehicle for um, the fire department inspectors. Um, so the city has demonstrated uh, that there's been a significant increase in calls for service due to the Encore facility and also a significant increase in inspections associated with Encore. Um, and they have also demonstrated that their existing radios um, do not work effectively in the facility. So um, the review team believes that they've made that nexus to the casino um, with this application. Uh, so the review team agree that the provision of EMT training will allow the fire department to treat patients at a higher level than they do now. Um, right now, the fire department will, will respond, but um, with the folks that aren't trained as EMTs, they essentially have to wait until an ambulance arrives in order to have uh, sort of that higher level of, um, of service. Um, and also the team agreed that the replacement of radios is appropriate to improve the level of communication within the Encore facility 
um, you know, facilities of this nature, all of the electronics and other things, we have had this experience at before with other agencies and other facilities, um, that communications can be quite difficult. Um, so we agreed that uh, that that certainly is appropriate. Um, and again, we've funded these in the past for other agencies. Um, and finally, the review team agreed that the uh, increased level of inspections uh, has placed pressure on the fire, fire prevention division vehicle fleet and warranted purchase of an additional vehicle for that uh, group over at uh, Everett uh, Fire Department. So for these reasons, we're recommending full funding of this grant in the amount of $157,000. And with that, I will open um, this one up to questions. Commissioners. Any questions, Commissioner Cameron? Um, not a question, but just um, how important that interoperability is. So that request in particular, I think is, uh, is really, really important in an in emergency situation. That's with respect to the um, communication the radios. with the yes. radios, right? Yes. So they, their technology seems a little antiquated. Is that what it is? Yes, so it's they just did not, not. They did not have the ability to communicate with the other agencies responding to an emergency situation. So that's the interoperability piece, which is really critical in any um, any uh, situation today of, of an emergent nature. Yeah, and they, they apparently had difficulty, you know, there's an engine outside and there's uh, people inside, yeah. just even the communications just to their, to their team were, were, were difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that being as a, 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 a good, um, an area where we can keep our eyes on this so that maybe it's a joint application for the departments as techno technology shifts so quickly. So... To the, we would like them to be able to be fully um, operational. It's actually surprising to me to see that they weren't. So, uh, you know, the GEU, the, um, the police department and the fire departments for all three areas should be able to be at, um, you know, keep up with technology developments as they evolve. Yeah, these these rate the radios that they're using uh, currently are quite old. I think. Yeah. The application indicates that they're yeah. sixteen years old, so that's yeah. pretty out of date when it comes to modern technology. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Those so the very good. large radios from sixteen yeah. years ago. <laughs> I also was very pleased to see the request for training. Um, it's the uh, for the it's. For the EMT training, so it's it's uh, substantive training, really important. And and I saw the evidence that they indicated that there were 600 more emergency um, um, interventions because of Encore. Given the number of people who are there, that number seems actually modest to me. But we do want them to be able to respond fast and to be able to intervene with all the tools they need. So I was really pleased to see them asking for that, that training money. I remember, Commissioner Cameron, you indicated that for public safety, that's an area where always training dollars are, are short. So this is a good Yes, use. it's one of the first things that get cut when you go before for, for your budget. I mean, it is critical, I agree. Yeah, so I was pleased. Any further questions on that before we move on to the second one? Comments? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so the uh, next application is also um, the city of Everett. Um, they are requesting $30,000 for the installation of um, street lighting smart controls to allow remote access to lighting and cameras in the Encore area. Again, the city has demonstrated an increase in traffic and traffic accidents as well as calls for service in the area um, so that they have made the, the necessary uh, nexus to the casino. Um, the review team agreed that providing these controls would allow for enhanced monitoring of traffic and security in the area. Um, initially we had some concerns with potential privacy matters uh, but the city uh, did assure us that um, these would not include any kind of facial recognition or anything like that, that they were really only to be used um, sort of to monitor 
the traffic situation in the area, you know, if they needed to provide some additional uh, police details or other things if, you know, traffic was backing up or um, to aid in, in investigations. You know, so we, we were pretty intrigued by this. Um, we do know that, you know, in the past there were a couple of incidences there where, um, you know, people left the facility and having cameras out there and the ability to access them directly at the police station um, would certainly be beneficial in, in trying to, um, you know, investigate uh, uh, issues in the area. So for these reasons, we are recommending uh, full funding uh, in the amount of $30,000. Um, any questions on this application? I'll say that, Commissioners. Commissioner Sunika? I think um, I'll just make a comment, but uh, but I think uh, Joe summarized it well. I I like uh, their approach. Um, it's in the scheme of things, it's short money for what what is a real essentially a real improvement into the overall um, monitoring because they're leveraging you know the the capabilities that they already have. They're just doing smart technology in, in these um, uh, so-called smart controls. So. I think it's a, it's a really good um, grant. Uh, I, I would agree. I think, um, first of all, uh, improved enhanced lighting is, is critical, right? We want to try to uh, cut down on crashes and, and uh, criminal activity and lighting is really effective for both. And secondly, the, the cameras, we see how effective they are in the casinos in the surrounding area, I think will help too, particularly important with, with crashes and other investigations. I'll start, Commissioner O'Brien, anything? No, no, it's it to, to your comment, Enrique, it's, it's short money for something that seems like it'll be a vast improvement for that area, their ability to respond. I have to say, I'm, I'm interested in, in, I'd love to see it. <laughs> um, once it's installed, it's, it's um, actually quite remarkable for thirty thousand dollars it seems mm -hmm. uh, so that's right. yeah i i looked up uh, I, it, the name is escaping me now but um i looked up their website the, the technology um uh, it's uh it's it's intriguing as you say yeah yeah, yeah it's ubiqua yes the ubiqua. Oh, yeah. that's the brand of the technology thanks okay no further questions Kate, okay, so good work so far. <laughs> no questions for Kate. Okay, uh, Joe, go right ahead. Okay, so the next one is Hamden County District Attorney's Office. Um, they have come to us for funds for the last few years. Um, they are asking uh, for seventy-five thousand uh, dollars to be used for personnel to mitigate the additional caseloads due to the MGM Casino. And of course, the uh, provisions of uh, 23K uh, call for offsetting DA costs as part of the community mitigation fund. Um, and um, obviously they do have an increased caseload because of the presence of the MGM casino. Um, last year, the DA's office received a grant for $75,000, but um, they've actually only spent a small portion of those funds so far this year because of COVID. And I mm -hmm. guess the, the courts were closed and other things of that nature. Um, they do expect that spending to pick up, um, you know, as the, as the casinos have reopened. Um, now, based on the 2019 grant, so originally they got, we gave them $100,000 the first year, and they ended up not really needing all of that. So some of that came back to us, and they reduced their request to $75,000 for 2019 and kept it the same for 2020. Um, that seems to be about the right number based on the 2019 numbers. But anyway, regardless, they operate under an ISA. So any unused funds come back to the commission at the end of the year if they, if they don't use them. Um, they can request an extension of that. And if they do so before the end of the fiscal year, we can consider that, but that's not being asked for at this point. So um, uh, with that, we do recommend awarding uh, this amount to the uh, DA. Questions? 
Um, yeah, I, I have one, Joe. We had talked the very first time this came up about them doing a tracking system so that they could have stats on the cases that generate out of the casino. I, I'm assuming most of them feed into Springfield District, but there might be some in the outlying district reports. Is there a tracking system that they have in terms of being able to figure out a portion of an ADA or victim witness advocate salary that goes to this? I'm gonna turn this one over to Kate. <laughs> yes, hi. Um, so um, Commissioner O'Brien, as you may be aware, there is a, a statewide uh, databasing right. system that has tracking capability that DA's offices use through the District Attorneys Association. Um, it's possible to modify that. Um, however, that hasn't been something that's been specifically investigated um, you know, by the DA's office. It's, it would be, um, I think, a pretty big technical ask. Um, so um, what they are trying to do is just, um, as you said, find a way to quantify those outlying cases that end up you know, in the surrounding district courts. It's, I think it is difficult, especially with COVID, um, but it is something we're in touch with them about. Although no formal tracking has been in place, they do certainly um, know that this money is being made available to them because there is specifically an increased caseload that's shared throughout the office as you witness advocates, um, you know, up through prosecuting attorneys. Um, so uh, I know I'm that's not- curious not if going forward, there can be, um, because I know we had this conversation, there was a request in Norfolk a couple of years ago, right. and they basically right. balked and said, we can't track. Um, and having been in DA's offices and AG's offices, there, there is an ability to track. I mean, I, I grant you the MDA database, if it can be retrofitted for this, is, that's the best way to do it. But if there's what, in fact, that would take to get accurate stats from the various DA's offices in the different counties, or to, have, to figure out if they're each trying to do it consistently. I'm thinking about Christopher Bruce's work as well and, and mm -hmm. trying to figure out a way to supplement the accuracy of that information. I actually had that same thought um, it could, because obviously um, Christopher Bruce's study is mentioned by some of our other applicants here. And I wondered if perhaps this may become easier with um, just one or two more years of reportable data, especially you know, with Springfield, but also if we had similar requests from Encore, um, just because it is you know, um, gathering this data, as you said, can be a little unwieldy. However, um, the longer these um, licensees are open and impacting our uh, applicants, kind of the easier it is maybe to recognize some trends and um, how they intersect with a study such as the one done by Mr. Bruce. Um, so I think it's a conversation we should keep open with this particular applicant and any other similar applications going forward. Right, because I'm also thinking that, that now that there are three of them are online, you've got multiple counties. I mean, you have Everett is technically Middlesex, but it's really sitting in the edge of Suffolk. So you have right. two sizable counties, plus you have Hamden, et cetera, and Norfolk. So you have you know, easily four or five, six counties that could give stats and benefit from a tracking system like that. So it might Correct. be something to keep in mind. Thank you. Any further questions? So I think the um, what I'm hearing from Joe is that the ISA creates that um, really as a safety valve so that if the dollars aren't needed, they come back anyway. Um, okay. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, that, that is correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll continue then on to the uh, Sheriff's Department. Okay, so the next one is the Hamden County Sheriff's Department, and um, you've all seen this one before. Um, so this is the sixth year that they're requesting lease assistance for the Western Massachusetts Correctional Alcohol Center that was displaced as part of the MGM construction. And as you probably remember, the commission originally agreed to pay up to $2 million in lease assistance for the first five years of the lease, which ended last year um, and you know through conversations with the commission and with our local community mitigation advisory committees and subcommittee on community mitigation um, you know we, we talked about this at some length um, you know the fact that uh, that this facility was displaced from the MGM casino uh, footprint um, you know, there clearly is an impact to them. And uh, the fact that they're, they pay an increased um, cost associated with their, their lease and their utilities and so on, um, there is definitely an impact there. 
but what was decided was that there shouldn't be any specific carve out of, for the sheriff's department in our guidelines, but simply that they're an eligible entity and can apply for funds as could any other eligible entity. Uh, and which is in fact what has happened here. Um, they're asking for the same amount of money. They're asking for $400,000. Um, you know, and based on the fact that there are, you know, the impact still exists um, and they're an eligible entity, um, the review team uh, does recommend that the $400,000 be awarded to the sheriff's department. And again, this, we've had this conversation before and it's probably beyond the, uh, scope of the discussion today but you know i think we need to determine what we want to do here long term uh and whether or not we want uh this assistance to continue or to not continue or uh to some phase out or whatever but again just uh i don't think that's an issue for today what we have today is an application for a certain amount of money and the review team is recommending that Commissioners, do you have uh, comments or questions for Joe? Commissioner O'Brien? No, I mean, I remember this conversation last year in terms of, you know, how far out do you go and say, well, you would have had to renew maybe anyway, maybe it would have gone up somewhat. Um, I understand that this 400000 is just for the year. As you said, it's the one, you know, filling the gap for this one year. A question that I had last year that I was hoping might be answerable is, what, when their lease term would have been up in the old facility? Yeah, we, we did ask whether or not they would still be under the, the old lease and their answer to us was yes, they were. Um, we did follow up with them and ask them to provide us a copy of that lease. We don't have it in hand yet. They said they would get it to us. So um, having Mary just follow back up with them, um, they were supposed to get it to us last week, but we didn't see it uh, come across uh, our desk last week, so we will continue to follow up on that. Okay, yeah, I would be curious to see that, to know exactly when the lease term would have ended under the, the lease from which they were displaced. And it's kind of interesting. It sounds almost as if they are they were like tenant at will. I'm not, I'm not sure that they had a, sort of a written lease, but we're following, again, or we're following up on that. Or was it into like a month to month, to your point, at will, because they'd been there so long? Yeah, they've been there, they had been there 27 years, and, and so um, the way the application was written, it seemed like that, but they did indicate they'd send us a copy of it, so we're going to continue to follow up. Okay. But they, they yeah. did say that they would have still been under the old lease terms for this year. And so the four hundred thousand dollars represents their annual carrying costs. Is that in full the the, um, or does it include? Is it the annual um, minus what they would have paid? I mean, how do you get to four hundred thousand? It's the delta um, mm -hmm. between. So in their original lease, their original lease interestingly included utilities. Uh, so what they did was they took what their new lease costs were plus their estimated utility costs and looked at what the difference was and um you know that essentially came out to be the four hundred thousand dollars a year and did you see that do you do they put that in the application yeah we have that we that was back in their original application and and they've essentially given that to us and and the lease that they're under right now is a 10-year lease 10 years yeah we did have a substantial conversation about this last year. Yeah, we did. Uh, and, and so, and we did it during this exact process. Um, so I guess I'd like to know, um, what we're expecting going forward. Enrique, you've, you've been part of the process um, as a member of the review team, which we thank you for your service on that. We're, what do you think about the long-term implications of this application? Um, in, in short, it's a, it's, a, it's a big question, which is what we've, mm -hmm. we've been wrestling with uh, recently. Um, and, and, and if we do uh, the same thing that we've been doing, we will continue to have this kind of conversation. Um, the last time um, we talked about it that I remember substantively, not only, um, there were two times actually, 
um, when we got the last grant, but when we also did the guidelines for the uh, for this year, which Joe mentioned, we said, well, we'll just make them an eligible applicant. We don't commit to a set amount for a set number of years. Um, so uh, again, we will continue to see this if we do nothing uh, different. It begs the question, as Joe points out, perhaps not for today, um, whether we do it at guidelines or in the future, there is, um, they don't have the incentive necessarily to, to modify um, their budget, if you will, and they do get funding from the state uh, elsewhere for other uh, parts of their program. Um, if they will continue to get the grant delta from from us. Um, now, having said that, we recognize there's an impact, and there was initially. The big question is, what is the longevity of this of this impact? Right, when would have been a lease renegotiation, a a new price, a need to move or upgrade anyway, because they were not necessarily in class A space where they were before. And those are all very hard answers, uh, very hard, um, very hard to answer those questions. Um, it becomes uh, uh, kind of like how, how we feel about it in general, ultimately, with the reality that there's not a big incentive for them to modify, certainly not before the end of their current lease. And just well, the, question, oh, sorry. The, the application points out, you know, that this 400,000 is not accounted for in their other funding source. Um, and, and begs the question to your point of, well, maybe going forward, there's some request that we look at any efforts that have been looking, you know, that have been taken to seek funding elsewhere. You know, if you do that and hit a dead end, that might be a different reception here than just to your point, relying on, you know, having the Delta fixed uh, by money that comes from us. Yeah, yeah. And the key would be, what would we consider reasonable efforts? Right. What kind of evidence could we, could we be satisfied with? Um, other than just them telling us <laughs> mm -hmm. that they tried and you know were unsuccessful. And it's a 10-year lease or is it a, um, a lease that's less than 10 years with options to for extensions? It's 10 year lease. No, it was a 10 10 year lease, yeah. So you know I think this is again, this is really a policy question of the commission. On, on sort of where where we think this needs to go. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to try to set up maybe a meeting with the um, sheriff's department, you know, later on sometime this summer and maybe with a, a, a subset of the of the commission uh, at that meeting to talk about some of these issues. And, and you know, I mean, they did ask us back um, last fall saying, well, we'd like you to consider giving us another five years of lease assistance. And, and we did consider that and decided that, no, we wouldn't do it in a block of five years. We would do it on a year to year basis, um, which is where, where we are today, or at, least for, at least for 2021. Um, and, and by the way, that, um, I think that's a prudent, even though it, it seems to be non-decisive, I think it might be prudent for the following reason. I think context here, um, is important. This is, as, as you might remember, we have um, followed on the recommendation from the local community mitigation advisory committees to keep the, the money that comes from each region within the region. Um, and that, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's effectively um, not necessarily taking money quote unquote, from other potential applicants elsewhere on that, except for the one region uh, of region B, which happens to be at least this year, um, less subscribed than the other region relative to requests and monies available. So if we continue to doing, doing the same thing in future years, you know, that landscape could, could, could change and could, could conceivably change the decision. Um, but that's another factor that I guess, relative to the policy, big policy question that Joe, um, you know, outlines, should should also factor in. And I, I think that that that's an important factor is that you know money is available in the region for this. If if we were oversubscribed by 
hundred percent. And then we had to make the difficult decisions of, well, we don't have enough money to give out to everybody. Where does this rank in in the commission's mm -hmm. thoughts compared to other applications? So that's where the difficulty would come in. We frankly don't have that difficulty this year. Right, and and for me, if if I were running, you know, if I were the uh, COO of the sheriff's department, four hundred thousand dollars is pretty good chunk of change to have to plan on if if we're not a, a you know an absolute steady stream of income for them over the next five years or or four years after this year but i think i'm understanding commissioner zuniga's you know very important point which is at a certain point something in that region may come up where those four hundred thousand dollars are vital to a different application and we might want that <clears throat> The ability to apply it because it fits even you know more neatly into the the needs of the of the uh, community mitigation impacts of the region so that's why i think we really did reserve that flexibility last year but it makes for a budgeting challenge for them i'm sure i like the idea of them pursuing other funds um, and not having that dependency, although I do understand that this is an impact from the, the relocation. I just wasn't there the first time when there was a commitment to the first five years and why it wasn't a decision to do the first 10 years, you know? So there, there was probably the thinking that's what we're doing right now, which is see what the needs are down the road of the rest of the region. Is that fair, Enrique? I think that's right. Um, and yeah. um, you know, and again, we can continue in the same venue because it's it's a year to year type of thing. Uh, again, it, it goes back to both the policy, the comfort level that we all have, versus yeah. the incentives, the, the lack of incentive or incentive that they don't necessarily. Yeah, I mean, because these are competitive dollars. You no know, doubt. it's not no a doubt. given. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Commissioner Cameron. Yes, I think the additional information, making sure we do get a copy of the old lease, figuring out what um, leases in the area, how much they raise per year, will help us with the policy question. I right? do too. And, I think so. And if dollars need to go somewhere else, is there a way to, at that point, have a tiered system where they're not losing all of it, but they'd be losing some of it, and we'd have right. some documentation to, to make those decisions. Yeah, I agree. So this is um, an area where today it would, we would we would not be voting on this one in particular. So we can um, we'll have until May six to get some further information on on this one. Excellent. Yeah, I think, I think really getting the lease is is the uh, is yeah. the key piece of information that we're that we're missing. Great, great. Any further questions or comments on? on this grant. Okay, Joe. Okay, the next one is the Plainville uh, Police Department. Um, they're requesting $95,500 for a multi-purpose uh, transport vehicle and some uh, traffic mitigation equipment to uh, help manage uh, traffic more efficiently um, in and around PPC, you know, when larger events are going on there and things of that nature. Um, of course, Plain Ridge has been able to demonstrate an increase in, in traffic and traffic related calls that is attributable to PPC. Um, so we agreed, the review team agreed that the uh, provision of traffic mitigation equipment, which this includes, I think, primarily an electronic signboard um, and trailer and so on, that would, uh, would provide some efficiencies for the police department. Um, and we also agree that the provision of a multi-purpose vehicle uh, would allow for the efficient deployment of the equipment, um, but they are also calling it a multi-purpose vehicle because they also want to use it as a prisoner transport vehicle, which uh, we like the idea of, you know, using a vehicle for multiple purposes. Um, and, you know, similarly, we, we, we did a grant with uh, Encore uh, last year or the year before for a prisoner transport vehicle and um, have done other um, projects of this type with, with some other communities. 
So we are recommending full funding of this grant in the amount of uh, $95,500. Questions or comments for Joe on this one? I'll set, Commissioner Brown, everybody looks like they're, yeah. Um, I just want to note that uh, Plainville Police Department didn't include any request for, for training. Um, again, an opportunity perhaps missed if there were training that was relevant to, to um, perhaps um, interactions or diffusions needed um, at the casino site. Uh, something to keep in mind for next year's applications. Well, we did certainly uh, at our outreach sessions uh, try to stress that um, with our Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you had, you know, a reminder that you did do um, those brown bag luncheons uh, and trainings to remind the potential applicants. And I think that's a great practice. And I suspect you'll be replicating that for next year as well. Yes, that's the intent. Certainly. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Okay, so the next one is the Springfield Fire Department. Um, they are requesting $22,000 to purchase new defibrillators. Um, um, and the fire department has demonstrated that there has been a significant increase in medical calls um, since the opening of the casino. Um, and primarily, you know, the reason for these new defibrillators are that, you know, the old ones are are a bit out of date, but also new defibrillators will be compatible with those used by AMR, which is their primary ambulance company in the city. Um, you know, they sort of trade equipment, not equipment, uh, you know, supplies back and forth um, when, when they're responding to operations and having the same equipment means they can use the same supplies, create some efficiencies for them. Um, so we, we believe, the review team believes that, you know, having this up-to-date equipment that's compatible with other users will be beneficial to the city and their responses to MGM Springfield. And also, you know, $22,000 seems to be pretty reasonable uh, cost for, for um, a project of this nature. Therefore, we are recommending full funding of the grant in the amount of $22,000. Questions, comments? Um, I want to note uh, the, that in this memo, in the event folks who are attending today's public meeting, that the memo does include in each section um, a response from our licensee. And MGM does say that they feel there's no basis for the sweeping conclusion that MGM is having an adverse impact on the Springfield Fire Department's annual budget. Ultimately, though, they recognize that the health and safety of the residents of the Springfield area, our patrons and employees are a top priority, and so they do support this request. But that was a, a notation I think is fair to, for um, us to mention in their response. And I like so much that the licensees are included in this process, Joe. It's a real credit to the, you know, the really the fulsome review that you and the team do. Yeah, we get we get written responses from each of the licensees, and we also uh, try to do a, a meeting with them as well, just to get you know a little a little deeper dive on on some of some of the the thoughts on some of the applications. So that's that does prove to be very helpful in in, in crafting our recommendations. Yeah, it really shows the you know how it's a real well, three sixty degree review, so thank you. Seems to me we want to have defibrillators that work. Yes, yes. Okay, if there are no other comments on that, um, we will go to the uh, final application for today's discussion, which is the Springfield Police Department. Um, they have requested $105,000 for improved connectivity from the GEU to the Metro unit and their and, uh, Springfield Police Department headquarters. They've also asked for an F-150 pickup truck, um, some equipment storage units, uh, protective shields, uh, bowler wrap, de-escalation equipment, 
and some traffic cones. So kind of a, a whole laundry list of items that they're looking for. Um, the review team is recommending partial funding for this grant in the amount of $22,500, uh, specifically for the data connectivity improvements, uh, for the storage units, and uh, for the traffic cones. So the police department has demonstrated casino-related connections for these items um, in that obviously connect connectivity improvements are between the GEU and the Metro unit and the headquarters. So uh, there's clearly some issues there on, on their communications um, between those different areas. Um, the storage units that they are proposing, these are kind of the uh, container uh, units that you see uh, in use. Uh, they have limited storage where they are and, and they need uh, some weather protected storage. In fact, for a number of the things that we've purchased for them, or they should say that they have purchased with Gaming Commission funds in the past. And then uh, the traffic cones, um, they're used for traffic control in the, in the vicinity of the casino. So we think there's a, a, a nexus there. So the review team failed to see the connection between the operation of MGM and the police department's need for the bowler wrap equipment and the protective shields. You know, there have been um, some large events, protests and large events that have been drawn to downtown Springfield in the last year, as there have been in many other locations. Um, but these events were not driven by the casino. Um, you know, they had the Bernie Sanders rally and that would happen at, at um, at the uh, Pacific Center and, um, you know, I mean, it didn't have anything to do particularly with the casino or, or an impact of the casino. So um, we do understand the need for police to be properly equipped, um, but there definitely needs to be a clear nexus to the casino in order to fund that portion of the grant. And we just didn't, we, you know, the, the dots weren't just weren't connected there for us. Um, Commissioner, also, I mean, Joe, before we continue, I, I feel, uh, is any commissioner leaning in right now? Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, and, uh, the, and then the last, uh, the other item, we also did not uh, recommend the purchase of the pickup truck. And there's a little little bit of, of a backstory here that, that, that I think we should just share uh, so we understand why. So a year ago, we approved the purchase of a pickup truck uh, by MGM, uh, by Springfield Police Department. Um, and back last September, they came back to us and said, you know, due to COVID related supply chain issues, they wouldn't be able to get a pickup truck. Uh, it would be months and months and months on back order. So they asked if they could replace it with a, an SUV type vehicle. And, uh, you know, we asked the question that as long as that can serve the same purpose, you know, towing trailers and the lighting and all those kinds of things and, and as long as it can serve the same purpose we were fine with that um you know as long as you know as, as long as they were okay with that as well um now with that said uh now they're saying they would really like to have a pickup truck but you know we feel that um that they didn't really identify an impact of the casino over and above that which they ident that was identified and funded last year. So, you know, we already bought them a vehicle. Uh, it would have been a pickup truck if they wanted to wait for a pickup truck. Um, they didn't want to wait for that. We feel like we've sort of kept up our end of the bargain on that and we, we didn't see any overriding um, impact that, you know, sort of newly created that this would, that this, this would address. So for that reason, we, we recommended not funding that piece of it. And um, so with that, I'll open it up for any questions on this application. Commissioner O'Brien. I just had one. I, I looked up the bowler wrap online, and it looks like something out of a Spider-Man movie, to be honest with you, when I looked at what it did. Um, so I <laughs> What's that like? It came from. It's, it almost looks like a taser. You know, but then you you go and these cords are released, and it's the idea is it wraps somebody sort of remotely, oh. restrains them remotely. Um, the protective oh. shields, I guess, the description. If you can help me, and I know that we declined to give them funding for certain riot gear um, last year. Are these protective shields 
a different name for the same thing, or is this a different type of protective shield? Would you like me to take that, Joe? Yes, Kate, please. I, mean, after, I feel like I should just direct my questions to you, Kate. Oh, that's all right. No, no worries. <laughs> I, this is, I will say, since we're at the final application to review today, this is a team effort. I may have done the deep dive, as Joe said, but I really have benefited from my colleagues on the, on the review team, so I want to thank them. Um, so uh, the bowler wrap, uh, that is exactly how I described it when I reviewed it, Spider-Man-like. Um, yeah, it and is. It likes yeah. stuff in the movie. I, I had some concerns about about it and um, you know did a little bit more research there and so uh, with regard to the shields this is a request the same it's for the same replacement of the same uh, pieces of equipment that were identified last year got it okay thank you sure I, so I, 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 oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. commissioner go ahead I, I was just gonna make um, a comment that I think the the if you're familiar with the gaucho bolas in in you know in Argentina, that's what they use. It's an old technology, of course. I think this 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 replicates that sort of idea of throwing uh, things that wrap around the legs of, of somebody. They use it for cows over there. Commissioner Cameron. Well, I I'm just listening to the work of the committee, and I've read read everything, and um, yeah, I, I agree with their decisions, um, uh, and especially where uh, Joe just explained to us that they were re very clear last year when they said, "Okay, we'll let you replace the vehicle, but it's as long as you're telling us it serves the same purpose." So, um, and the clarification on the other two pieces of equipment make a lot of sense too. That there's no direct. Um, casino impact. So can can I just ask a point of clarification? It sounds as though, and I don't remember this, forgive me, I definitely remember the request about the riot shields last year. They've used a different word apparently and said protective, but we'll get to that in a second. In terms of the, um, the um, pickup truck, um, we approved that in our regular course of business last year. And then they came back in September. I know there's all kinds of um, supply chain issues. They came back, but not to the commission. They came back to you and said, we'd like to swap it out. And it must, are you saying then, Joe, it was in that threshold that we've given you to, um, that didn't have to come back to us? Or did it come back to us? That's what I can't no, remember. We we didn't come back to the commission with it. There was no change in price. It was it was the same cost, and you know we're saying as long as it's as long as it suits your purposes for you know what we gave the grant for, you know why not was was more or less the <laughs> right. And you and you made record of the the change, and so now so they yeah, got they, the contract, and they definitely did the purchase of the SUV truck. They did. I should say vehicle, it's not really, that's the point. Um, okay, and then in terms of the request on the bowler wrap equipment in the protective shields, Springfield um, Police Department did know last year that we had extensive discussion around the request for riot shields and we declined them last year because our, our expert in public safety right on our very own commission Lieutenant Colonel Cameron pointed out that it really wasn't the protective riot shields aren't really something that would be used at the casino property. Is that am I remembering that correctly, Commissioner Cameron? You are, Madam Chair. You're remembering that correctly. And so the request was made again. Is there anything that they offer in the application process to distinguish why it would be appropriate this year? I can, um, well, well, uh, Mr. Delaney is looking that up in our paperwork. I think that this year, Madam Chair, the request for the protective shields, um, this was more in line with, um, again, kind of crowd control rather than any response to large scale um, violent events. I think last year they were also perhaps described as ballistic shields, which generated some considerable discussion. So in conjunction with the request for the bowler wrap, um, perhaps the department sought to reframe this as kind of a crowd control device, um, which 
is certainly I would say um, is is maybe an alternative use, not the use that comes immediately to mind. Um, but at this point, I think that that was my interpretation anyway of of this kind of reframed application because these two pieces of equipment are distinct from the um, other pieces of equipment that are being requested by the department, which really link back to requests they've made in the past, um, such as the Connex container, which is that metal weather tight secure storage container for items they've, um, you know, purchased with mitigation fund money in the past. Um, so this did not seem to to harken back to any prior requests, and I saw it as. Um, but I won't say a new request, but I think maybe a reframed request with the addition of the Bola Wrap um, technology, perhaps to cement it as more of a crowd control equipment request. Um, whether or not the commission agrees with that perspective uh, by the department certainly is, is why we're having this discussion today. So, and just looking at the application, um, what they talked about here, they, they were talking about having sort of large uh, gatherings, public protests and other things of that nature. But the way that they try to make the tie to the casino, and I'll just quote this here, it says, in one year we have responded to multiple, well-organized, generally peaceful protests, one of which drew a crowd of approximately 6,000 people. For the larger protests, we remained in constant contact with our officers assigned to the MGM Gaming Enforcement Unit, as well as the MGM Head of Security. With each large gathering, a significant concern was held by all that high profile locations would fall victim to impulsive acts of random violence and malicious destruction of property. Um, so that that is really um, sort of the nexus they were saying is that they're, they're concerned that that MGM could be become a target of that because it's a high profile uh, property. So it'd be for property preservation as opposed to life preservation no i guess they're trying to make the the, the, the nexus to the casino which has been always our litmus test oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. one of saying we would be protecting the casino in an event in the event that some large protest went out of hand let's say um but to to, to me it starts and end there um i think um as, as the review team recommends and 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 at least Commissioner Cameron seems to agree. I think the nexus to the casino is is, is low when it comes to this kind of equipment. It's very, very un unlikely that there would be, um, in, my, in my opinion, um, the need for for this, this type of activity to be linked to the casino. Yeah, I, I asked the question in part, I didn't know if it was some sort of COVID related protective shield. That you know things are going to be opening up. They're going yeah, to have that's, balance. So that's that's kind of why I asked the question, thinking, well, maybe there was some other, you know, COVID-related, you know, equipment that they were looking for, sort of going forward that they would be able to monitor as things reopen. But it sounds like it's right. really the same item. Right. And by the way, I I don't blame um, the Springfield uh, uh, PD and people for thinking about these these mm -hmm. things. I think you know. They are uh, seeing a, a number of activity. Uh, we're all watching the news, etc. cetera. Um, but but in, in, in my opinion, this, this, this starts and ends with the, with the charter that we have relative to mitigating the, the harms of the casino. And I, I just don't see one here. Uh, I, I'm gonna chime in here. I agree, um, we did, um, I don't see that in the course of this last year, that there's been a change in circumstances that really make me think now that I know that the protective shields are really very similar to what was requested last year. And now that I understand that bowl of wrap actually means wrap, um, thank you for looking that up, Commissioner Bryan. Um, and I'm not hearing from Commissioner Cameron that it would be equipment that would be necessary. She's, you know, for the record, shaking her head no. Uh, what I might have liked to have seen again is um, this is an, uh, uh, an area of, of, you know, as Commissioner Zuniga points out, you know, concerns um, in terms of controlling, um, you know, a, a, a site that brings thousands of new guests to Springfield in, in 
in that we we like that because Christopher Bruce's reports are not showing a, a, a you know knock on wood a significant uh, increase in public safety concerns, but it is showing an economic driver, and we hope that it will continue to increase in that front as um, COVID restrictions are you know are decreased. Uh, I would like to see maybe a request for some good training here. Um, I, again, um, an opportunity for Springfield to get different tools in their tool belt, the softer ones, right, Commissioner Cameron? Um, yeah, I agree. And, and so, you know, again, I, I just wanna, um, I would love to see, you know, I understand the desire for equipment. I'd love to see the offset of also some soft, um, some soft uh, tools. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm inclined to agree with the recommendation and we'll, I don't think we're asking for any, do we need any additional information for next, for May 6th on this, commissioners? No, I'm seeing no. All right, but for you know the next year grant uh, again, uh, opportunity for Springfield Police Department to really uh, be creative on those soft um, tools. Commissioner Cameron, do you want to chime in? I think it's all been explained well. I think the appropriate questions were asked, and um, you know there is no real nexus there that that I can see at all. And I think uh, you brought up. Um, Christopher Bruce's evidence-based report, which which does not indicate, uh, um, you know, a rise in criminal activity. Um, so I, I I think we do have to be cognizant of tying this to casino impacts, and uh, I don't disagree with anything said. Yeah, and and again, just the licensee response indicates that MGC does not believe that its facility or operations attract a greater concentration of prolific offenders than otherwise present in the area. To the contrary, MGM's development efforts and revitalization of a previously challenged urban area push such elements out in a way. So their bottom line is they point that out as they did in the, with respect to the fire department request, but they do say that they support any resources that will benefit their efforts to keep residents, businesses, and visitors safe. So MGM duly noted their, their response. All right. Good. So uh, I think at this point, your presentations have been yeah. all made for today. So that, yeah, that concludes our presentation for today. Um, you know, on the 6th, we'll be back with the, um, hope we'll be we're meeting tomorrow. So hopefully um, we'll be back with all, with the remainder of these on the 6th. And we will also probably start into the, some of the transportation applications at that meeting as well. And I think um, if, if we, if you agree, it might make sense to then take the vote if we get all, you know, I'd like to see all four public safety, you know, completed for next, if we can, and then take a vote on that category. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Excellent. Commissioners, are you all set? Okay, then um, I think we look forward to the uh, continuation on May 6th. And I thank everybody for these good reports. Karen, are you all set? Yes, I am, thank you. All right, Councillor Grossman, are you all set? Mary Thurlow just left. <laughs> she, that's an indication, that's an indication. Yeah. There she is, are you all set? <laughs> Uh, Todd, are you all set? Set, yes, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you, Kate, for your work. Um, Tanya, thank you for your work today. Commissioners, I, if you have no further business, then we, and, and no commissioner report. Well, I can, on just on that note, I can make a quick update. Uh, I was honored to have been uh, invited to the to give a presentation at the Japan Integrated Resort Association. Uh, these days, webinars are um, a lot easier to access. Um, so I was able to do that on the other side of the world. 
um, and uh, present them, as you said, case study of the legislation, what we did in terms of licensing and the mitigation measures apropos the, of the mitigation of the uh, that we're, uh, conversation that we're having today, uh, as the Japanese are uh, considering uh, a lot of the same uh, policy questions in their renewed um, effort to, to approve casino gaming down there. Right. I should That's say true. that uh, they continue to regard Massachusetts as a good example, an example worthy of looking at uh, in the, the law, the, the, the regulations, the decisions, and the outcomes. So it's, um, it's a testament to the work that we've all done over the last uh, few years. You know, uh, perhaps Karen, we didn't, we, I think folks knew this, but uh, our IEP was also asked to speak to a Japanese delegation and, and Loretta and Captain Connors did an excellent job. They were quite thrilled with, with the input, as you can imagine. So the Japanese delegations continue to seek our input and you know, that is a credit to Massachusetts, Commissioner. And I now remember, I don't, I forget if I also mentioned uh, Loretta and Todd helped me in, in, a, in a, another conversation. This one was in that web, a webinar. This was just a, a research oh, good. person who wanted uh, essentially the, the same thing. In other words, there's quite a bit of activity both in Japan um, and, and looking at other jurisdictions and we continue to be one of the ones that they look at, which again, uh, is, is uh, uh, um, perhaps something to be proud of. I think so. Uh, and then for those of you um, who were able to take a look at the white paper that came out of the AGA, Commissioner Cameron's expertise um, on uh, the illegal gaming machines was, was noted. We're proud of that. So thank you, Commissioner Cameron, um, for that Welcome. work. I, th I think the report was well done. I think they do good. Uh, the, the, some of the work that they've produced is really helpful to uh, to the gaming community. Yeah, I, um, I'm not sure if, um, if the communications department has put that out. It's been on LinkedIn through the AGA, but um, I think we can also uh, provide it through the MGC LinkedIn too. I'm not sure about the cost, so I shouldn't jump out at that, but um, again, uh, probably will be at least in our newsletter, so uh, to to pass it on to a greater community. Um, excellent. Anything else, commissioners? All right. And we'll have a um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any comments, questions? All right. Roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Seneca. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you, Tanya. And uh, thank you, everyone. It's always so nice to be able to gather, even though it's virtual. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, thank you.